are you going to be good? It's really uncomfortable. The bench? The, this, because it's this molding. Oh. Do you want to, I think you could, you could take a chair, like move one of those chairs over to the back if you want. I mean, just use the chair. That could work. I just okay. don't want you to be uncomfortable. Cause yeah. just, cause I mean, it's like. The, the, the bleacher seats. seats. The bleacher seats. It's like. Can I get my okay, it's up to you. I don't up to you, but, but I mean, you know, there's a. That one here is chairs. Okay, let's do that. Okay. Is that okay? Diana? Good morning. This hearing uh, will come to order, and it's an important hearing, uh, one of which addresses one of the most persistent, horrific human rights abuses of our time, but sadly one which has received, not received widespread attention and scrutiny and condemnation that it absolutely deserves. Almost two years ago, Sir Jeffrey Neese te testified before a hearing I chaired in, on forced organ harvesting in the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission. For those who don't know, Sir Jeffrey was the lead prosecutor of Slobodan Milosevic at the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia. He is a serious man who engaged in a serious attempt to investigate the evidence of forced organ harvesting as the chair of the Independent People's Tribunal into forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience in the People's Republic of China, or simply they called it the China Tribunal. Sir Jeffrey summarized for us that day the final judgment of the China Tribunal, and he put it this way. The Tribunal found unanimously and sure beyond a reasonable doubt that in China, forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience 
has been a practice for a substantial period of time, including a substantial amount of victims, close quote. Among those victims, he said, they were most certainly the most vulnerable populations in China today, prisoners, Falun Gong practitioners, and Uyghurs. Forced organ harvesting on an industrial scale in China is an atrocity unmatched in its wickedness, one that has to go back to the horrific crimes committed in the 20th century by Hitler, Stalin, Mao, and, or Pol Pot to find a comparably systematic uh, type of atrocities. The number of those executed or for their organs, some even before they were brain dead, is staggering. Thus, the tri China's tribunal final assessment was that uh, state-sanctioned forced organ harvesting in China amounts to, quote, crimes against humanity. So here we are to again contemplate, and this is the third hearing that I have chaired on this issue, an unimaginable and unacceptable crime. We are here because the Chinese Communist government is the world's largest jailer of political prisoners and responsible for a genocide targeting the Uyghurs. We are here again because there are those who doubt or ignore the tribunal's findings, pointing to the PRC's 2015 bogus promise to only source organs from voluntary donors, even though evidence presented by one of our witnesses here today, Matt Robertson, demonstrates that this data has been falsified. We are here again because nearly one year ago, the House passed the Stop Forced Organ Harvesting Act by an overwhelming majority, 412 to 2. And we needed to see the Senate pass it and to do it immediately. It's been a year. With respect, I do ask again uh, that the Foreign Relations Committee and the full Senate simply pass the bill. It was bipartisan. We vetted it with the U.S. Department of State. Uh, we had a tremendous input from so many. Uh, and it is, it is ready to become law. And I hope and pray that the Senate will move. That landmark and bipartisan legislation authorizes the Secretary of State to deny passports and visas to any individual involved in illegal organ trafficking in China and globally. It also mandates annual reporting by the State Department on forced organ harvesting globally and, the, and authorizes sanctions for individuals and entities that facilitate forced organ harvesting. In December of 2023, a group of civil society groups religious freedom advocates, trade unions, bar associations, and human rights solidarity groups wrote to Senator Ben Cardin and Senator Jim, Jim Reich, the chair and ranking member of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, urging the committee to pass the bill. They said the bill represented, quote, the strongest legislation ever introduced by any country to combat the grotesque atrocity of illegal forced organ harvesting. We await the Senate action, and I am confident, because I know uh, Ben Cardin and others, they are very, very honorable men, uh, I am confident that they will indeed take up the bill. Since the China's, China Tribunal's final judgment, researchers continue to investigate the Chinese Communist government's uh, and, uh, deep dive into the data on organ harvesting. Indeed, we will hear from two of the best, two of the absolute best, Ethan Gutman and Matt Robertson. All of you are tremendous leaders, and, but the, these individuals have done uh, amazing investigative work. It is reliable, it is actionable, and we're so grateful uh, to have them here. We, also, uh, to, uh, we will also look to how medical journals, bar associations, human rights groups, the United Nations, corporations, and U.S. state legislatures are grappling with the legal, ethical, and human rights issues associated with being complicit in forced organ harvesting. Dr. Maya Mitalipova from MIT and Dr. Tom Overson, a Texas state representative uh, who actually wrote a law for Texas on, on this kind of atrocity in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, tourism, and I want to thank him for that leadership, which is being replicated by other states. Uh, they will discuss what has been done and what more needs to be done to address the PRC's transplantation abuse, including the issue of organ tourism, which often fuels the illegal organ trafficking market. For more than two decades, I have tried to shed light on forced organ harvesting uh, in China. Matter of fact, uh, at one of my hearings of my subcommittee, and this goes back to the 1990s, 
uh, when Harry Wu put us in touch with a, 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 um, a police officer who had pictures and documentation of executions that were occurring uh, with the ambulances right next door all lined up in, in, in a queue uh, to take those prisoners and to steal their organs before they died. And then they had the audacity to charge the parents or the family members, the wife or husband, for the bullets. I mean, you talk about, well, they are just um, incredibly um, uh, cruel in how they, they mistreat people. In the 1990s, Chinese doctors, nurses, security guards came forward again to describe all of this. To now, I'm, today, I'm announcing an initiative to seek firsthand witnesses information on forced organ harvesting in China. We hope that people will come forward and tell their stories. They will do it with anonymity to protect their identities and those of, of their loved ones, and we are absolutely committed to that. But we need that information uh, to build this case further. When we passed the bill last March uh, that went over to the Senate, uh, the Chinese embassy here in Washington uh, claimed it was all lies and, 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 and you know, completely uh, uh, repudiated it from their point of view. And they also said, anybody who wants to come to Xinjiang, uh, we have nothing to hide. This was said separately, but they said it there as well. Um, uh, come on, get your tickets and come on over. We immediately wrote a letter to them saying, I want to lead a congressional de delegation to Xinjiang. We have repeated that offer over and over, and today at this hearing I'm asking the Chinese embassy uh, to allow me to lead a delegation to Xinjiang uh, immediately. Uh, let's work out the details. During the worst days of the Soviet Union, I went to Perm Camp 35 with Frank Wolf, a uh, congressman from Virginia. Uh, it it was, seemed like it was mission impossible. We talked to the procreator general for all of the Soviet Union, who said, we've got nothing to hide. So we went to Perm Camp 35, where Natan Sharansky and many political prisoners were, and we videotaped every single prisoner there, and we worked uh, for their release with very, very good, keen information. I hope the Chinese will reciprocate and, and show uh, a very similar openness, since they're claiming they have nothing to hide, well, let us come. Uh, my bags are packed. My staff's bags are packed, and we will have a delegation uh, all ready to go. Just, just give us the green light. I will, uh, I will be sending, finally, a letter to Secretary of State Blinken asking him to offer rewards for information from witnesses uh, that will disrupt uh, and deter the forced organ harvesting industry in the PRC and bring accountability to those engaged in this absolutely gruesome practice. The State Department has programs to offer rewards for information on crimes against humanity and human trafficking. So this would very, very, I think, be a good part of that initiative. I invite any and of my colleagues to join me in signing this letter, uh, copies of which are available for your consideration. Silence is unacceptable. Silence is not an option, particularly from medical associations and corporations. If they remain silent, they are the most at risk of complicity in this heinous crime against humanity. We will we will all hear some degree of, we all bear, I should say, some responsibility to act. This, uh, this is an ongoing fight to demand transparency and justice and an end of this egregious human rights abuse. Uh, if we don't act now, many more lives will be lost. And I thank you, and I can't thank our witnesses enough for being here and for throughout the year and years being the source of so much uh, credible, actionable information that has enlightened what we do on this commission. I'd like to turn to my good friend and colleague, Commissioner Steele, uh, for any opening comment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, this is, I think this is one of the most important committee that, you know, we are here to show the whole world that, you know, what this CCP has been doing. So thank you to the witnesses for your courage to raise awareness of this sensitive and horrific problem. My both parents fled from North Korea from communism, and I heard so many stories, but this is getting really worse. Congress and the United States must use every tool to find evidence of organ harvesting and prevent it from happening. So many political prisoners are including Uyghur and Falun Gong practitioners are suffering at the hands of CCP and other communist countries actually they're following that. And I see that from Vietnam, Vietnam and other communist countries. So we must stop this. I have met with several survivors of the CCP's inter 
internment camps that torture and enslave minorities, including Uyghur, and have heard firsthand about the horrors experienced, experienced at the hands of the CCP. In June, I sent a letter to U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken calling for immediate action to prevent those who participate in the CCP's forced organ harvesting industry from earning immigration status in the United States. We must do whatever we can to prevent the organ harvesting industry. I look forward to learning more today about the steps that we should be taking to prevent these human rights atrocities from continuing. And thank you for coming, witnesses. And Mr. Chairman, thank you for doing this meeting. And this is very, very important that the whole world know that exactly what CCP has been doing to these minority communities. So thank you. Commissioner Steele, thank you so very much for your statement and for your leadership on this commission. It is greatly, greatly appreciated. I'd like to now yield to our good friend and colleague, the co-chair of the China Commission, uh, Senator Merkley. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. This is an important hearing. Welcome, everyone. The issue of human rights abuses in the organ transplant system has been a long-standing concern of this commission. For example, back in 2006, the commission reported that, and I quote, executed prisoners likely are the source of the majority of organs used in transplant operations in China, according to reporter statements from Chinese officials and reports from U.S. human rights organizations. The notion that prisoners, including prisoners of conscience, might be executed so their organs can be transplanted into other people is horrific. This is an area where we can say that international pressure appears to have produced some results. In 2014, China pledged to stop obtaining organs from executed prisoners and to, quote, ensure the voluntary donation from citizens is the sole legal source of human organs. But have they done what they promised? Many experts have cast doubts about whether China has adhered to its pledges and abided by international standards, and that's what we're here today to explore. A Congressional Research Service report notes that, and I quote, researchers on organ harvesting in China have relied largely on circumstantial evidence, logical inferences, and interviews to support their arguments. In part, this problem can be blamed on the Chinese authorities, who make it extremely difficult to get accurate and trustworthy data. The system is not transparent. The Chinese government has refused to agree to independent or international investigations into its organ transplant practices, and Chinese government has provided information that refutes the allegations of human rights violations. We need facts to make assessments and formulate policy. We must continue to demand that the Chinese government provide more transparency so we can assess whether they are meeting international standards. And we must take care not to let our policy responses be based on circumstantial or outdated evidence. Two years ago, the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission, in a hearing chaired by today's chairman, Representative Smith, addressed this topic with two of the witnesses here today. I look forward to any new information that they have uncovered since. Chairman Smith is also author of the Stopped Forced Organ Harvesting Act, which passed the House a year ago. I'm a co-sponsor of the Senate version, and I hope we can soon move it on our side. Lastly, I observe that one clear action that the Chinese government can take to provide assurances that its institutions are not harvesting organs from executed prisoners is to stop executing prisoners. I urge China to ratify the second optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights aimed at the abolition of the death penalty. I should note that for, significantly, for significant but different reasons, the U.S. should do so as well. Thank you for being here today for this important discussion. And I look forward to your testimony. Thank you, uh, Chairman Merkley. I'd like to now introduce our, our distinguished witnesses. Um, our first two witnesses are researchers who doggedly pursued the subject of forced organ harvesting and, we, and are well known to this commission. They have both produced some of the most compelling evidence available of forced organ harvesting in the PRC. And for that, we owe them a huge debt of gratitude. They have both testified at hearings that I've chaired on this issue over the years, and Ethan stretching back over a decade now. Both are engaged in important research, and, and more of that will be forthcoming in the coming weeks and months. 
Uh, Ethan Gutman is the China Studies F Research Fellow, Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, co-founder of the International Coalition to End Transplant Abuse in China, and author of the seminal book, 2014 book, quote, The Slaughter, Mass Killings, Organ Harvesting in China's Secret Solution to Its Dissident Problem. He has also co-authored the influential 2016 investigative report, Bloody Harvest, The Slaughter, an update with David Matas and David Kilgore. He is currently working on a new book based on his personal interviews with Uyghur and Kazakh refugees throughout Central Asia, entitled uh, The Xinjiang Procedure. Matthew Robertson, who will be joining us by way of Zoom uh, from Australia, is a China Studies Research Fellow and Data Scientist at the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, a PhD candidate in political science at the Australian National University, and an incoming postdoctoral fellow at the University of Mannheim in Germany. Matt is a leading expert on organ trafficking uh, harvesting in China and regularly gives lectures and presentations at academic conferences, briefs government officials, and has provided expert testimony to U.S. Congress and the China Tribunal. His work has been published in peer-reviewed journals, including his groundbreaking uh, 2022 article, Execution by Organ Procurement, Breaching the Dead Donor Rule in China. American Transplanta uh, Journal of Transplantation carried that, which showed that surgeons were being used as executioners in China. Our third and fourth witnesses will talk about how medical research institutions, corporations, and U.S. state legislatures are grappling with the legal and ethical implications of forced organ harvesting and organ tourism, which often fuels the illegal trafficking of organs. Dr. Maya Metalapova is the director of the Human Stem Cell Laboratory at the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research, MIT. She was born in Kazakhstan and trained in genetics and embryology from the Moscow Human Genetics Institute. Her scientific achievements are world-renowned and include animal cloning at the University of Wisconsin in Madison and stem cell therapy. Since joining MIT, Dr. Mitalapova has focused on the study of Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease. She has also applied her expertise to the study of DNA collection and mass DNA sequences in China and its implica implica implications. She has previously contributed recent testimony to the commission with regards to complicity with China's human rights abuses, a topic that she will elaborate on today. And finally, Dr. Tom uh, Overson is a practicing anesthesiologist uh, representing Texas's 130th State House District in North West Harris County, including the communities of Tomball, Cypress, Waller, and Hockley. Dr. Overson serves as the chair of the House Committee on Insurance in, and is a member of the Public Health and House Select Committees on Health Care Reform. Nationally, he is president of the National Council of Insurance Legislators. He is widely regarded as an expert on health care policy solutions, having authored multiple groundbreaking laws that have established Texas as a national leader in health care reform, including a bipartisan restricting state insurance payments for, Texas, for Texans seeking organ transplantation uh, in China, which is a national model for other states to follow. And I hope my state of New Jersey follows your lead, doctor, and I deeply appreciate that leadership. Congratulations on that, and we look forward to your testimony as well. Uh, Ethan Gutman, the floor is yours. I'll focus on uh, recent developments today. Uh, specifically, the CCP's systematic harvesting of Uyghurs and other Turkic groups. Uh, just as the rise of China's transplant system was built on the persecution of Falun Gong, Harvesting is now bound to the Xinjiang camp system constructed from 2016 to 2018. Now, I want to also use this as an opportunity to respond to the CRS uh, casting a little sh uh, shade on witness statements. Uh, so, Congressman Smith, please forgive the repetition with previous testimonies in this case. Uh, but I will go through estimates of annual camp disappearances, particularly taking into account the strengths and the weaknesses of refugee testimony. And I will move to a case study in Aksu, and I will conclude by describing a shift in Western transplant surgeons' attitudes over the last two years and the implications for U.S. policy. Now, let's begin with a Kazakh doctor 
the Kazakh doctor, uh, Saragul uh, South, uh, South Bay, I always, I'm not good with the pronunciation there. She was employed as a Chinese language teacher. And Saragul made herself useful throughout her camp, uh, following a camp-wide health check, that's what they called them, including comprehensive blood tests. Saragul was asked to sort out the camp's medical files. She noticed a colored check mark on certain files in the 23 to 35 year old age range based on tissue typing. From Saryugal's perspective, she only lacked the external list of individuals who would receive the organs. She was certain on this point. Now several camp survivors noticed that following the blood test results, some prisoners were forced to wear colored bracelets or vests. There was no apparent logic to the color grouping, only that these people were in their late 20s and they were healthy. Witness testimony is far from perfect. Personal bias, trauma, and partisanship can influence the results, but I don't believe these elements are distorting the testimony here, and let me explain why. First, every refugee was from a different camp. There was no collusion. Second, outside of the rape room, all 20 camps had installed cameras and listening devices uh, and other than saying something like, pass the plunger, speech did not really exist. Uh, in an environment of suppressed social contact and omnipresent and arbitrary interrogation or sexual abuse, humans compensate. Like starving animals, hearing becomes acute. Vision sharpens. Minute changes in their environment are keenly observed. Uh, Third, most camp refugees who I interviewed in Central Asia were Kazakhs. With a relatively porous border and a nation state that occasionally lobbies China on their behalf, the Kazakhs view themselves as accidental prisoners. They don't like their Chinese overlords, but most Kazakhs are not loyal to the Uyghur cause. They had no motive to manipulate numbers, to reach a particular result, or to please me. Fourth, the interviews were purposely broad. Most witnesses had no idea that I was forming numerical estimates, and the majority were only dimly aware of organ harvesting in the first place. Uh, I wish to avoid false precision here. Even my most analytical witness, Ovalbek Turdakan, who recently escaped from Kyrgyzstan, could never determine the exact number of detainees in his camp. What emerged from their testimony is that there are two kinds of people who leave the camp early. The first group is about 18 years old on average. The announcement that they are going to work at a factory or perhaps in a Bing Tuan, a military run cotton farm, is usually made during lunch. Light applause is often encouraged. Now, the second group is aged between 25 to 35. The average is usually 28. This was very explicit from uh, witness to witness. Uh, the age that ch the Chinese medical establishment prefers for organ sourcing. They are removed in the middle of the night. There is no applause. They are not to be mentioned again. There were a couple of outlier witnesses, but 90% of the witnesses were fairly consistent. 2.5% to 5% of the camp go missing exactly this way every year. Now, I don't have a plausible alternate explanation for this. And assuming there are 1 million in the camps, I estimate 25,000 to 50,000 Uyghurs are harvested annually. Let's go with the lower range. The Kilgore Midas Gutman report of 2016 uh, that Congressman Smith mentioned estimated China's annual transplant volume at 60,000 to 100,000. Using the minimum estimate, let's assume the Uyghurs and Kazakhs can be harvested for at least two organs. Uh, that translates into a minimum of 50,000 organ transplants. That's the lion's share of China's annual transplant volume, and it's supplied by 25,000 dead people. Now, on the assumption that the Gulf states organ tourists prefer Muslim donors who don't eat pork, uh, the CCP has tried to capitalize on the switch from Falun Gong to Uyghur sources. At least one Chinese transplant hospital blatantly displays a Muslim prayer room and halal canteen on the web. Yet the logistical challenge of shifting away from the coastal area of, uh, from the coastal area of China to Xinjiang, 4,000 kilometers away from the hospitals which organ, uh, foreign organ tourists prefer, required perfusion methods and, West, and, and Western technology. I'd welcome a question on that. Uh, it also required a streamlined infrastructure. And there's one example of that that's a very good one. Picture a re-education camp 
for 16,000 people. Picture a hospital, Oxu Infection Hospital, that performs organ transplants. Picture a second camp for 33,000 people constructed around that hospital. And picture a large crematorium. And now, in, the fact is, in Aksu, all these structures are less than a kilometer away from each other. RFA reporter Gulchera Hoja first noticed this anomaly, and witnesses can confirm it. Uh, a Uyghur conflict explained that the Aksu Infection Hospital was originally for SARS patients. In 2013, it was repurposed as a re-education hospital for extreme Muslim dis dissidents. Uh, the crematorium has a prominent Chinese sign, the air smells like burnt bones. A second Uyghur male confirmed that local workers constantly complained about the stench. Now, it's a 20-minute drive to Aksu Airport's human organ transplant, transport channel. That's an export-only fast lane to move human organs east. That's its only function. First hospital, Zhejiang Province, uh, is uh, near Shanghai, not too far from Shanghai, and it's a designated big brother to Aksu Infection Hospital, and they report that their liver transplants increased by 90% in 2017, while kidney transplants increased by 200%. Uh, on March 1st, 2020, First Hospital performed the world's first double lung transplant on a COVID patient. This was an advertisement to foreign organ tourists that China was still open for business. I'll conclude, uh, I'm over time, and I'll conclude with policy. Beginning in 2012, the Western transplant, Western transplant consensus was not to investigate China, I agree with him, but to engage with and lead the Chinese transplant industry to a, uh, to a soft reform. Uh, this consensus, it's, it's upsetting stuff. This consensus, however ineffective, acted as a break on unified congressional action. In 2022, the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation, ISHLT, decided to impose an academic boycott of China. The next year, the ISHLT asked me to present my research and the research of Robertson, Levy, Matus, and Kilgore at their annual conference, and I did that. Now, no transplant group has followed the ISHLT's lead at this time, uh, but Congress has a responsibility, I believe, to act on an ongoing human rights catastrophe, but they must also respond to ISHLT's courageous act. Uh, realistically, the infrastructure of harvesting may be too robust to save Uyghur and Kazakh lives in the near term. Yet Congress can stop Beijing's ongoing attempts to normalize medical deviance, to spread this practice. And the passage of the Stop Organ Harvesting Act could galvanize the international transplant community to stop seeing research and investigation into Chinese harvesting as inflammatory or a deal breaker, but instead as a quest for justice on behalf of those young women, men and women whose only crime was that they were healthy. That concludes my remarks. Thank you. Mr. Gutman, thank you very much for that very um, extensive testimony. And um, it really does inform us, motivates us, and I want to thank you so deeply for it. Um, I'd like to now ask uh, Matthew Robertson if he could um, join us um, from Australia. Hello. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman and ranking members for inviting me to testify at this important hearing. And thank you to the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, which has supported my research on this issue for many years. Um, the atrocity of forced organ harvesting in China has been occurring for decades on a large scale and has claimed tens if not hundreds of thousands of lives. It's a state-sponsored program that has targeted political prisoners and members of dissident groups that Beijing sees as a threat. We know this based on evidence from China's own documents and medical papers on which rigorous scholarly analysis has been published in leading academic journals, including the American Journal of Transplantation. Anyone who doubts the evidence can consult the work of the China Tribunal chaired by renowned, renowned former war crimes prosecutor, Sir Jeffrey Nice. And I refer to this in my written testimony. Beijing says it has reformed its organ transplant industry into a purely voluntary system since 2015. 
but the official data supporting this claim has been demonstrated to be falsified. My co-authors and I published this analysis, a forensic statistical analysis in a leading academic journal, BMC Medical Ethics, in 2019. Given Beijing's well-documented practices of propaganda and information control, especially around what it deems to be sensitive issues, we have every reason to believe that the atrocity continues today. This means that anyone who travels to China for a transplant organ could unwittingly cause the murder of an innocent human being and at the same time provide financial gain to an illicit industry that advances Beijing's goals of eliminating its political enemies, real or perceived. Any institution worldwide that collaborates with this industry would be indirectly supporting this activity, including hospitals providing training to Chinese transplant surgeons, universities facilitating transplant, facilitating transplant research and knowledge transfer, and businesses supplying transplant products and technologies. While Beijing's main target of organ harvesting has been death row prisoners and practitioners of Falun Gong, millions of Uyghurs are now also vulnerable to this abuse, as you've already heard. Beijing has conducted mass blood typing and DNA testing on vast swaths of its Uyghur population, often under the banner of health checkups. There is no institutional constraint on this data being put to predatory uses such as organ matching. Today, for the first time, I can tell you about some new evidence of these practices from internal Chinese police files. A computational analysis of personnel records contained in the Xinjiang police files. This is a cache of hundreds of thousands of files hacked from police computers in China by an anonymous third party and passed exclusively to my institution, VOC, shows that over 200,000 of more than 500,000 persons in two counties in Xinjiang have had their blood samples taken. There are also numerous references throughout the files to DNA collection. As the files end in 2018, we can assume that since then, many more Uyghurs have been blood typed and entered into such databases. Well, on their own, these findings obviously cannot prove that Uyghurs are being harvested for their organs. But blood type is a necessary preconditioned organ matching, and DNA data allows for better organ matches. Given the PRC's history here of killing prisoners for their organs and its, co its collection of this information amid this mass internment campaign should be highly concerning. And we've heard the, the same evidence from two different angles today. So what can policymakers, lawmakers do about this? I have a few recommendations here. I elaborate on some of them in greater detail in my written testimony, um, and I'm happy to expand on it in the Q&A. And uh, the US-based consultancy, consultancy Global Rights Compliance has also published a useful legal advisory, Do No Harm, and that has detailed recommendations about cutting ties with PRC entities engaged in this abuse. Uh, however, before even cutting ties, there's a lot we don't know about the extent of the complicity and the involvement of US institutions um, in supporting this activity in China. So to begin with, um, Congress could ask the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health to audit their grant making over the past two decades to uncover any funding that's been provided to PRC medical entities that have been involved in the transplant industry. Before 2015, almost all transplants in China were exclusively from prisoners. This is even admitted to by Chinese medical leaders. So there, there are thousands, at least hundreds of hospitals involved here. And any of them that have failed to uphold human subject protections, um, they should not be receiving federal funds. So Congress could exercise its oversight powers another way. It could call US hospitals and medical centers that have trained Chinese transplant surgeons to account. They could gather data from those institutions and then that would build a record of which surgeons have been trained, what have they received training in, and then we could match that with VOC's databases about activity in China to understand what knowledge transfer from the United States has facilitated organ trafficking in China. Finally, more aggressively, the US government would freeze the assets and deny visas of any PRC individuals who have engaged in organ trafficking. So we have lists of thousands of surgeons and hundreds of hospitals and from Chinese medical databases 
And these could be used to build dossiers on perpetrators and to identify them uh, for visa denials and uh, asset seizures. I'll be pleased to share this work uh, with the Commission upon request and correspond further. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And I do hope, you know, going forward, especially, God willing, we get this bill into law, that you would share all of that with the U.S. Department of State and other agencies of the U.S. government to be so that we really draw a very, very focused uh, scrutiny on this. So thank you so mu very, very much. I'd like to now ask uh, Dr. Uh, Metalopova uh, to present her testimony. Uh, dear Congressional Committee, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to, uh, to testify today in front of you. Uh, the Chinese government is building the world's largest DNA database by acquiring DNA sequencing data from companies within China and across the globe, including USA. Number of biotech companies are assisting the Chinese police in building this database. They include US-based Thermo Fisher Scientific and the Chinese company BGI, Beijing Genome Institute. BGI in particularly is very dangerous because it collects DNA of Americans and uses it for research with the Chinese military. Chinese authorities are enrolling in genome surveillance tens of millions of people in Tibet and in Xinjiang, Akka East Turkestan. Those individuals have no control over how their samples were collected, stored, and used, and neither they know of the potential implication of the DNA collection for them and for their extended families. Since 2016, biometric data collection program was launched in Xinjiang, where data from estimated 15 million of Uyghurs were collected under the guise of free annual physical exams. Note, the Han Chinese population of the region were exempted in this program. Despite it being free exam, no results were returned to these residents. Mass DNA sequencing is a costly project. The least expensive sequencing of a small portion of DNA today can cost $100 per sample. The sequence of 15 million of samples can cost at least one to two billion dollars. To maintain this database for tens of millions of samples, you need substantial number of professional bioinformatics specialists, specialized computers and software, and expensive sequencing machines. Why is Chinese government investing billions of dollars to sequence the DNA of an entire population of Xinjiang and Tibet? What can DNA sequencing data be used for? DNA sequencing can be used in basic biological research, disease discovery, finding the novel treatment, forensics, ancestry research, and in organ transplantation. Now, let's see which of these uses can be applied to Uyghur people in Xinjiang. Finding disease mutation and ancestry research in the region where Chinese government is conducting genocide against Uyghurs, the answer is no. The forens for forensic investigation on the rest population of Uyghurs who are not yet detained, on people who are tightly monitored, on the margin it can add to the cost of DNA sequencing by tightening surveillance capacity. But the answer is no. Then the only other reason for DNA use left is for, for organ transplantation. And yes, its use for forced organ harvesting and transplantation can absolutely justify the enormous cost of mass DNA sequencing. According to witnesses, authorities in Xinjiang on mandatory basis withdraw not only blood for DNA, but also perform ultrasound check of all internal organs, including iris scan. Again, patients never receive the results of these health checks. China's organ transplantation industry accounts to a minimum of 60,000 organ transplant per year. Least expensive kidney transplant can cost around 70,000 US dollars. And some other uh, organs can cost to up to a half a million dollars. In free countries like USA and Europe, organ donor recipients are in wait list for years if, and some for the months for matching donor organs, while in China, the matching donors can be found in few weeks. 
According to a research conducted by Ethan Goodman, estimated a minimum 25,000 Uyghurs are subject to forced organ harvesting per year. For successful organ transplantation, doctors rely on several important criteria, including three main blood tests, cell surface tests, and limited DNA tests to determine if a patient and a potential donor are a match. Karen a genetic tests detect differences in DNA sequences at just a few specific locations in the genome of transplant recipient and their organ donor. The fewer the differences are, the better the chance of long-term acceptance of the new organ. A whole genome sequencing data for a large number of genes would give a better match of donor and recipient organ, which in return will result in no rejection and long-term survival of the uh, transplanted organs. When a patient requests an organ in China, his or her DNA sequence data will be blasted against millions of DNA database stored in the computers. Within a few minutes, a perfect match will be found. If a potential donor of the organs is not in a prison or camp, then Chinese authorities can easily find a re reason to detain a match to be killed for their organs on demand. This is the one and maybe the main reason why Chinese government invested billions of dollars to DNA sequencing of entire population of Xinjiang and Tibet right now, because it will make exponentially many more billions of dollars per year in return. Term of Fisher involvement in forced organ harvesting in Xinjiang is undeniable. But while it has vowed to stop selling sequencing machines to the region and to stop providing technical support to maintain them, the company very successfully selling HLA kits and other custom-made DNA profiling products for organ transplantation as high as in 10 million range. The continued sale of DNA profiling products and technologies by Thermo Fisher to China has to be stopped by Congress. It's timely for U.S. Congress to pass the bill introduced by Senator Hagerty and Senator Peters prohibiting foreign access to American Genetic Information Act of 2024. This legislative will help to protect sensitive <coughs> genome data of Americans to be used by foreign governments like China, whose business practices threaten U.S. national security. There is also growing evidence that academic research universities and publishers are across the globe, and in particular U.S., are complicit in aiding the use of genetic technologies to surveil minority gr groups like Uyghurs and Tibetans in China. Professor Murai and his colleagues warned scientific publisher PLOS One, who is based in San Francisco, of 96 published research paper and papers and raised the issue that these papers hold sensitive genome data of minorities ethnic groups, and only 12 of the 96 flagged papers have been retracted so far. And ethic concerns go beyond scientific publication. Data collections from these publications commonly used deposited, commonly deposited into genetic databases, which are the resource not only for medical researchers and population geneticists, and in some cases, a law informant agencies. I ask the Congress to take actions to restrict US academic research universities and scientific publishers to share any technologies with Chinese companies and Chinese government like BGI. And I urge the Congress to question and if necessary to sanction Thermo Fisher for aiding China in the genocide of innocent Uyghur and Tibetan people and prisoners of conscience throughout the mainland of China. Thank you so much. Doctor, thank you very much for your testimony. Your a number of very important recommendations to us that we will follow up on, and so I thank you for that. And it is now pri my privilege to uh, introduce Dr. Tom Oliverson uh, fr from Texas. Good morning, Chair Smith, Chair Merkley, and members of the Commission. My name is Tom Oliverson, and I'm a board-certified anesthesiologist and Texas State Representative where I chair the House Committee on Insurance. Thank you for allowing me the honor to speak with you today about what Texas has done to combat the horrific practice of forced organ harvesting. I first became aware of the horrors of forced organ harvesting through the advocacy efforts of the Southern USA Falun Dafa Association. 
Through the examples and eyewitness testimony that they provided, I became aware of the horrific persecutions faced by Falun Gong practitioners in China. Around the same time, I met with members of the Chinese Uyghur community through the advocacy work of the Minaret Foundation, a pattern of religious persecution, incarceration, and execution for government profit became clear. With the help of these organizations and the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation, my colleagues and I have worked for several years to honor the victims of communism and advocate for justice for the victims of forced organ harvesting. In 2021, I joined authored a resolution condemning China for their forced organ harvesting practices and through separate legislation created a Victims of Communism Memorial Day in Texas. This past year, we approved the creation of a Victims of Communism monument at the Texas Capitol, the first of its kind at a state capitol, and had our most significant achievement to date, the passage of Senate Bill 1040. Senate Bill 1040 by Senator Lois Kolkhorst and myself is an attempt to choke off the demand for stolen organs, since in Texas, we obviously, we can't affect the supply, so we're attacking the demand. By prohibiting health benefit plan issuers in Texas from providing coverage for medical and surgical treatments associated with organ transplants performed in China or in another country known to participate in forced organ harvesting. While Texas's jurisdiction may be limited, Senate Bill 1040 works precisely because solid organ transplantation surgery and the medical aftercare associated with it is so prohibitively expensive that most Texans could not afford such care without insurance coverage. And if you ask any insurer, they will likely tell you that this group of medical and surgical costs are the most expensive of all care subsets that they cover. As Senate Bill 1040 was working its way through the legislative process, we were able to hold a press conference to allow those impacted by forced organ harvesting to share their stories. I believe these firsthand accounts were the reason that we were able to pass this bill with the overwhelming bipartisan majority that we did. We had several survivors of Chinese detention camps share their powerful stories with us. They told us about the daily horrors of being a religious and political prisoner and about those in camps who would suddenly disappear, never to be seen again. They spoke of undergoing a series of medical tests, not for their benefit, but rather to assess their overall health and tissue type. They shared that because of their healthy lifestyles and abstinence from alcohol, Falun Gong practitioners and Uyghurs were the most often targeted groups. Bills modeled after Senate Bill 1040 have already been heard in the Arizona House and the Utah Senate, where they have successfully passed the committee stage. A similar bill in the Missouri House recently received a hearing, and Idaho and Illinois are in the process of passing similar legislation. Senate Bill 1040 sets a crucial precedent, but it has limitations. In my home state of Texas, only about 15% of all issued health plans are subject to state regulation. The rest are federally preempted and regulated by ERISA. This, I hope and pray, is where members of Congress like yourselves come in. Passage of legislation like Senate Bill 1040 at the federal level would massively expand the number of health plans subject to this bipartisan human rights protection and strike a huge blow to the inhumane practice of organ harvesting. I'm immensely proud that the work that we started in Texas is being modeled in other states and I'm so thankful for the work that is being done by this commission to force the conversation at a national level. I firmly believe that passing this sort of legislation at the federal level will ensure a future free from the scourge of forced organ harvesting, and I thank you for your time today. Dr. Oliverson, thank you for your leadership, for getting a bill that has become the prototype and the pioneering law for all of us to follow. So I thank you for that leadership. It's extraordinary. And also the fact that, you know, since you are on the national level, you know, the head of the insurance um, um, initiative for lawmakers, that, that others will pick it up, and, and I include my own state of New Jersey in that. Um, uh, Chairman Merkley does have to return to the Senate. Um, he was coming in late because they had a vote, and now we have to come back, and I really appreciate him coming across to the House side, but I yield to him such time as he would like. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you all. Uh, Mr. Gutman, the implication of your testimony is that the individuals, the Falun Gong or, or Uyghurs who are disappearing, are not returning. Is that my correct reading of your testimony? The your assumption is that they are being executed? Yes, they are being executed for their organs and, and in the case of the Uyghurs being 
Uh, you can turn on your microphone. If you turn on your microphone, we'll be able to hear you better. Yeah, the, the assumption is that the, with the Uyghurs at least, that they're being uh, uh, transported in some state, sort of suspended animation to the East Coast for harvesting. In the New York Times this last week, there was an article regarding Afghanistan and people in dire conditions uh, selling their organs, but the, they were basically selling one kidney. I'm not sure if they were also sell, selling uh, liver or not, but the kidneys were highlighted. Um, but in that case, there's lots of folks who can be interviewed who donated or who sold an organ. But we're not seeing that in China. We're not seeing people, uh, was it reinforcing the sense that people are being executed? You don't see people who have sold an organ. Well, I, I think that's certainly, po a lot of things are possible in China, and there's an, all kinds of business that takes place, uh, especially in the kind of gray market, not black market, but kind of white gray market in between the white market and the black market. I, I would say this. The, uh, what we've seen is a massive growth. I think uh, 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 certainly my colleague Matt Robertson would have something to say on this as well, uh, in hearts and lungs, particularly lungs. It's a very dramatic growth. Uh, so we're not getting the sense that China has surpassed the kidney stage on this uh, quite a while ago, actually. And, and uh, they are the leader in heart transplants and uh, uh, operations in the world today. Certainly. In the, um, the assumption in Afghanistan is that the organs are supplying a market perhaps in Herat, but, is there, but it did raise in my mind the question, and I'll ask this of anyone in the panel who has insight on this, is whether China is also supplementing the, the organ supply by, by flying in organs from other countries. Does anyone have any insight on that? I have never seen good, solid evidence that they are flying organs out from China. It is perfectly possible from the site I mentioned for Maksu, uh, which is a, you can get a medium range airplane to fly to Saudi Arabia, for example. That would be possible, but I've never seen the evidence. Uh, I've also heard of the military supplying Japanese uh, off the coast and submarines and so forth, but there's no, absolutely no critical evidence on that, not witness, not uh, anything we found. So the, way, the weight of the evidence is the organs are all coming internally, the, the vast majority of the Yes. Well, thank you all very much uh, for your, your testimony and um, um, what a profoundly troubling situation that people are being uh, uh, executed, um, identified as by their DNA, by their blood type, systematic um, accounting for that, uh, being, being matched and supplied kind of executed on demand to uh, both folks internal to China and folks tourists coming in for the Oregon tourist business. Uh, thank you all for this very powerful testimony. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I'd like to, uh, Mr. Gutman, thank you again for your leadership, uh, which informs this commission and I think the whole world on this issue. Uh, you did point out that on the assumption that the Gulf State Oregon tourists prefer Muslim donors who don't eat pork. Uh, the CCP has tried to capitalize on the switch from Falun Gong to Uyghur sources. At least one Chinese transplant hospital blatantly displays its Muslim prayer room uh, on the web, yet the logistical challenge of shifting from the coastal area to Xinjiang, 4,000 kilometers away from the hospitals, uh, which organ tourists prefer, requires perfusion methods and Western technology. Uh, could you maybe elaborate on that? Because that is really, I mean, we, we've been trying to figure out why Falun Gong, I mean, they're still murdering thousands of Falun Gong practitioners uh, and, and, and stealing their organs. Uh, part of our thought was, well, maybe they're, they're running out of 28-year-olds, and that's, you know. Uh, running out of what? 28-year-old victims. Oh, 20, 20 year I, I, so they're I think, looking for others. But, yeah. but this adds another dimension to it, that they're looking uh, for Muslims to and they kill other Muslims in order to procure their organs. The, the evidence is that in 2013, uh, they started running out of Falun Gong organs. Then the, the reason we know that is because they started to visit Falun Gong in their homes and doing a, in fact, a DNA blood, cheek swab, it was a primitive DNA test, and blood test in their homes. These were people who were not incarcerated. 
This was very unusual. Uh, and it happened in, I believe, six provinces simultaneously. Now, in 2014, that's when the mass health checks of the Uyghurs began. So it, it seems to me that they were looking for a, another source at that point. To really make this very quick, what happened was that uh, a, a doctor, Ko Wenjie, in Taiwan, had uh, pioneered a new method of live organ harvesting that would preserve organs very, very well. Uh, and he was doing this in a kind of gray area legal zone in Taiwan. Uh, he then went on to uh, push. He became a salesman for Medtronic, uh, which is an American company. I think you guys are familiar with that. And uh, Medtronic uh, makes ECMO, uh, the ox ex this oxygenation system. And uh, there was a second off-label use that had been identified about 2008 when he gave a major talk at a, at a conference in, in China. And that was organ preservation. You could increase organ viability from, say, four, four hours to 16. Uh, the Medtronic device, ECMO device, is too large. It's a big machine. So they needed a mobile machine. And there was a German company, well, there's still a German company, named Hemavent. I'm not sure I'm even pronouncing that correctly. But they made a miniaturized portable version of an ECMO machine. And beginning in 2017, Hemavent auctioned their devices to China on a mass scale. Now, we've looked at those actual auction records, and 50% of those hospitals fall into exactly, are from the transplant hospitals that we identified in our 2016 as very likely organ harvesting centers. Now, the, uh, in June 2019, here's another clue for you all, sales of ECMO machines stop, and they're replaced by ventilators. Now, that may have been an early outbreak of COVID uh, for, I, I, on its own. It's just a, one piece of data. But I think the important point is that uh, it, what is not speculative here is that Hemavent was sold to the Chinese company Microport in October 2021 for 123 million euros. Uh, so this is obviously a very valuable technology. I'm sure the Chinese have reverse engineered it by now. But you can see how Western technology moved into this gap in China and made, helped to make the harvesting of Uyghurs uh, profitable. Do you want to speak to that, uh, Dr. Milit uh, Militopova? Yeah, I just want to. Mm. Yeah, I just want to add that um, the technologies are developing day by day and months by months. And those technologies can be applied to um, evil practice like forced organ harvesting and tra trans transfer of the organs right now, I think it's not an issue because if you ox oxyg oxygenate the organs and they, you can transfer it not only within the China but maybe a neighboring countries where they um, actually train the medical doctors and the surgeons. And now I think they start training them in Central Asia, like Kazakhstan and uh, Uzbekistan. So it's kind of a warning sign when China start um, training the medical personnel on these particular technologies. Can I ask you, uh, does anybody know when a victim is brought into the hospital um, uh, to have their organs um, stolen and then death. Uh, are they aware of it? Uh, how much pain? We know the psychological pain could be, could be beyond words, but do they experience physical pain? Uh, the doctor that testified at our last hearing said uh, his victim uh, wasn't even anesthetized correctly and was in shock and, and kind of like was awakening as this gruesome uh, Joseph mengele like process was occurring. And I'm wondering if, if um, you know, and anesthesiologist, uh, Dr. Overson, you might want to speak to this as well. But how do they get them? Do they drug them uh, as soon as they take them away from the camp? You know, that up to 5%, as you mentioned, Dr. Uh, Ethan Gutman. Um, do they know where they're going? I think there's a lot of very sketchy evidence on this. But it is true that initially Falun Gong practitioners who were uh, uh, coming in from the camps uh, made this claim that they were using low anesthesia 
to save money, to make it even more profitable. Uh, and there is at least some, as I say, sketchy evidence because some of the stories that come out are uh, 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 kind of outrageous and are seemingly told backwards. In other words, they're, uh, the way sometimes witnesses tell stories. Uh, ha having said that, uh, Enver Totti, the doctor who performed live organ harvesting on a living human being, uh, made the point that if you don't use enough anesthesia, it is like, he said, you cannot cut up a rabbit even if you have four men holding the rabbit down, he said. So he feels this is impossible. So I think it's, it's mixed on that. Uh, I would imagine that what we're looking at is a very sophisticated operation today in Xinjiang, uh, East Turkestan. And, and basically, you are looking at uh, entire people being moved. Now, very normally, ECMO saves lives in the West precisely because you can move a very sick person from place to place. And it even is very useful for organ harvesting because you can remove one organ, one kidney, one liver, and then still go back home uh, for six hours. Everybody can take a break and then come back to it. And as long as that heart is still beating, uh, the, uh, the organs are oxygenated. Now, this is very valuable. In the Chinese context, it's very sinister. Okay, it means that basically the PSB, the Public Security Bureau of China, does not want to take living people or people who are not in some sort of state of suspended animation. I don't know how else to describe it because I'm not a doctor. Uh, but to put them on a plane and in the hold and move them. Now, there's, and there's, uh, this has been uh, verified by at least one doctor in Taiwan who works in the mainland on a continuous basis, that that is pretty much how he thinks how it is done, though he believes also it is possible to move individual organs uh, in a kind of oxygenated form as well. Dr. Oliverson, did the, um, <clears throat> what about at the federal level? Obviously, we've got Medicare, we've got other kinds of insurance, Obamacare. Um, uh, uh, is there a place for us to be doing something vis-a-vis -vis, uh, federal insurance policies, health policies? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. I, I think that any type of uh, insurance product uh, reimbursement system uh, that would allow a patient to engage in medical tourism, um, to be clear, not all medical tourism is bad, per se, right? But, but any uh, situation where a person could go overseas to China and receive uh, organ transplantation and, and care thereafter um, and be reimbursed for that or have that bill paid, uh, that's what we uh, shut off in the state of Texas. And so I'm not familiar enough with the, the CMS rules if, if it would cover a procedure uh, performed on, on a federal uh, health insurance product overseas, but assuming that it would and it could, then, then yes, sir, I think that should obviously be included. And that would also include those reimbursable through tax credits policy that we have uh, in abundance here as well. So we will follow up on that. And I, again, your, your law is inspiring not just other states, but uh, a federal look that's going to bear fruit, I believe. You know, um, one other question to Ethan Gutman, and then I'll go to my good friend and colleague. Um, you pointed out in 2022, the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation imposed an academic boycott. Uh, what are the other groups, if you are aware of them, that have not? And what does that actually mean? Uh, is it robust? Is it, you know, they just don't deal with them? Uh, or are they bringing some light and scrutiny to this, this ongoing terrible abuse? I'm sorry, I didn't really fully understand the question. So, uh, the, the Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation boycott, the, acad the academic boycott. Oh, I see, China. yeah. Uh, exactly what does that really mean? Uh, and, and also, some of the others that should be doing this, mm. who are they and why aren't they? Uh, what it means, I, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually pretty important because basically it means they cannot publish in our journals or in, in the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplant Journal, which is probably the most important transplant journal in the world today, arguably. Uh, the, uh, so that's significant. It means that they won't attend conferences. China is... Uh, uh, attending, and in fact, when I spoke at the at Denver last year, the two Chinese surgeons had slipped in to a crowd of 3,600 surgeons, and they hired a bodyguard 
in case I guess they were going to take a blow dart and fire it at me or something. Uh, instead, they just stormed out in the middle of my speech, which is sort of standard behavior. But the point is that uh, I think it's very significant. There's a huge loss of, look, part of this is about hitting China in the purse. And obviously, we've, been, um, we've all been talking about that, and I think that's very important. But part of this is about face. And we, the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation has withdrawn any possibility of the Chinese, uh, uh, you know, they, they've said, look, if you can give us evidence, if we, we can go on the ground and verify it, we'll do that. We'll pull the academic boycott, but until then, it's, it remains in, in effect. And they've held that this year, as I understand it. They're having a the big meeting in Prague, I think, right now. Uh, so I think that's significant. The other groups uh, have not joined them. There's other a lot of different transplant groups, but certainly, of course, the transplants, <laughs> the transplantation society you're very familiar with, uh, because you you talk to the main guy, some of the presidents there. Uh, what we've gotten from them is silence. Since the Uyghur business began, they used to carry Beijing's water and give Beijing talking points. They don't do that anymore. And uh, so uh, it's an interesting effect. We don't know. Uh, Jacob Levy, uh, the Israeli doctor who changed Israel's policy, uh, particularly on insurance, HMO insurance to China uh, for transplants, uh, is the main, he's on the ethics committee of ISHLT, and he really push this through. It all comes, it really comes down to him. He's a hero for doing that. Uh, but as he says, uh, right now the ISHLT is in a state of brilliant isolation. So that is where we stand. That's why I looked, I tried to make a point of uh, looking to the political system here to kind of uh, stand with them at this time, because I think that's such a significant change in the medical community. Uh, Dr. Robertson, did you want to weigh on, in on that? Yeah, there's something to say about, uh, for instance, the Transplantation Society. So it, it has had a, a very different perspective to ISHLT um, for these many years. And so the, the current president of the TTS, I mean, he has personally uh, worked with Chinese surgeons who've been um, among the most egregious in these abuses. And some of them have circulated through uh, institutions that he was at, like uh, the Cleveland Clinic um, in the United States. So they basically believe that China has reformed its transplant system. And they, they seem to think that uh, whatever abuses may have happened in the past, number one, they're not that curious about what the nature of them was. Number two, they think they've all been cleaned up. Um, and the TTS is um, is kind of the, the global professional body for transplantation, not just heart or a particular uh, subfield. And so the, the leadership there um, makes, you know, influences the views of the larger international body of transplant professionals and even the wider medical groups. So that's why ISHLT's um, stance here is so much more impressive because they've just they've looked at the evidence very closely and made a determination and hopefully those other groups will come along part of my recommendations um, about you know looking into uh, what institutions in the united states have trained chinese surgeons um, and getting accountability over that and investigating the funding um, is it's part of a deterrent effect to kind of join the, the more isolationist camp and put some teeth on these policies um, because otherwise there is no, there's no social cost uh, for these surgeons because they don't get, you know, negative attention by media or, or kind of the major human rights groups. And so they, they don't have a cost to this. And they've been friends with uh, these Chinese surgeons engaged in these activities for a long time. Um, and so they just don't have an incentive to change their policy at the moment. Thank you very much. You know, the End Organ Harvesting Act will help not only sanction those who are committing these horrific crimes, but it'll also uh, empower the State Department to do robust reporting in a way that will be very similar to what we do on human trafficking, religious freedom. So it will make a difference and, and people will no longer be able to say, oh, I didn't know. Michelle Steele, our Commissioner from California.
Thank you so much, uh, Chairman. This is very, very important. It's not just in the United States. We are making sure that our citizens are aware of what's going on in CCP, that what's, what's happening that CCP has been doing in China, especially when you are hearing that CCP saying that organ harvesting is voluntary, voluntary you know, system, that's just totally nonsense and we all know. I think the whole world has to know that what's going on inside of China, that's going to open up other co communist countries such as Vietnam and other areas because they're so closed. We don't even know what's going on in those prisons and you know, what these people are doing. So actually, I sent a letter out to 17 opera, uh, the Olympic corporate sponsors before the Beijing uh, Olympic that I asked them that they are spending billions and billions of dollars for advertising income. Can we spare some of the money? And then you know what these advertising they are having a good chance to let people know in the world that what CCP has been doing, not just organ harvesting, but other stuffs too. But you know what? 17 companies, I never even got one answer. So for them, profit is more important than human rights. So it's really sad to see that you know we are not going to the right direction. So how can government and non-governmental medical organizations work together to raise awareness and what tools are needed to stop this in the world. And what do we have to do? Because we must work together, not just United States, but whole world have to work together. So any witnesses wanna, you want to talk about, just let you know answer this question. I would say the universities that uh, develop the technologies. And the technologies actually can be used, it could be a, such a different range of technologies can be used for the practices as, as organ transplantation in medical field. You know, and so many technologies are shared, shared. and a lot of, um, I would say that um, programs like at the universities like Confucius Institute or 1000 Talent program that they have launched uh, to fund specifically fund the professors, and it's in, in any field, and especially in a field of science, like um, chemists and biologists and so. And what they have done it by giving the grants to these professors and training their scientists, and which uh, science is international, and you can't really um, discriminate a Chinese scientist, and I work with Chinese scientists, they're great are co uh, my colleagues, you know, and I know that they want to do a science for humanity, and it probably doesn't even cross their mind to do something else. But their government, you know, sends them them, and I don't know even if they're aware of those professors in the United States who are working on a thousand talent program and been funded. You know how it goes, that they have an access to internal university, internal services and where the IPs, intellectual property offices. And we, when you are beyond the firewall of the university, and it's a stealing those technologies. And those technologies that's been developed on the tax money of the American um, people, and we as a scientists are developing these technologies. But, but the US government has to look into, we close quite a lot of Confucius Institutes who also been on the geese that there, there would be a culture exchange and so on and so on. But eventually, those were, the, those were a propaganda, CCP Propaganda Institute. I'll uh, reclaim my time. Um, <laughs> yes, sure. It, thank you very much. I'm on Ways and Means Committee and I'm on Education Committee, so my deterrent act actually just passed. Um, Chinese government actually poured money in over $200 million in UC Berkeley in California, my state and UC Berkeley never reported, but they brought Chinese officials and researchers to their you know, really sensitive research center, and they did a tour, and they received the money. My deterrent act passed, so anything they received from China, Iran, or those countries of concern, any even coffee they have to report to the department that you know what they are receiving because it's getting really dangerous. It's not just for 
China, but you know, all these pro-Hamas and terrorists too. Yes. So Qatar was putting a lot of money. So we see that and we are looking at into those universities. So I totally agree with you. But second, uh, the question that you were talking about actually for, you know, we have to stop uh, involuntary collection of medical and DNA information in American companies. So you're talking about CCP is stealing our data to send to BGI and use those data for what? And how we can stop here is gonna be helpful to stop organ harvesting. I think, you know, the CCP, the BGI is run by CCP and I don't think there's any question about that, you know. But BGN Genome Institute by itself, it really hasn't developed any technologies in the, in the DNA sequencing or so on. So what they have been doing it, and the, and the Chinese government would give them money to acquire a lot of companies, small or big, and they couldn't acquire Illumina as far as I know, but a lot of small companies in the United States, they acquired, for, they bought, literally bought it. When they buy these companies like 23andMe, and we submitted, a lot of Americans submitted their DNA information, and how it can be used in the future when the technologies will develop, we don't know what, what technologies and the technologies are developing. You know what it can be used for, and we call it the 21st century, as a century of biotechnology. So the medical fields has developed and, and that's how we have uh, improved the human health and the, and the uh, average lifespan is, has increased, especially in Western countries, because of those technologies have been developed. But when you come to the CCP, when they hold that genetic information of Americans, that is a private information. Of course, they might not do a, some bioweapon per se, if somebody tells me probably it's impossible at this moment. But what they can do, they can jeopardize somebody's private information about a caring mutation. Let's say somebody in Congress had submitted to 23andMe the, to find out some of the mutations or something, or even the, where your ancestors come from. But that information right now, right, in the hands of, of CCP, literally if it's BGI had acquired this, and how they can be used. They can actually, just knowing the, some disease mutation that somebody who are power, in the power in the United States or decision makers in Congress would have that information being used by, by Chinese government to jeopardize that person private information, maybe in an election, or let's say like, you know, they had a children outside of marriage. You know, they can actually confront that person, a literal black male, and maybe take him out of the, of the, this whole information is so private and sensitive, and I can't believe that, like, you know, that, like, the companies like 23 and, and me or any other DNA companies could actually sell all our personal data. It's almost like my passport. My credit card was sold to China, and, and they know now everything about me, including my, my home address and everything entire my and Thank even you, my kids and my grandchildren wouldn't be safe Thank because you so I much. share my DNA with them my time is up sorry uh, chairman <laughs> I yield back I think this is so important that the, um, the government will take care of this Commissioner Nunn is recognized well thank you very much commissioner and I want to compliment uh, Commissioner Steele, ma'am, did you have any follow-up that you wanted to take on that? I didn't want to cut into your time. If you've got a follow-on. I have actually so many questions yes. regarding this, and you know what? I'm so much interested in this. Organ harvesting is the awful things. It, this should stop, and this is not just in our com commission that we have to do it, but we have to do it all over the world. We have to stop CCP that dominating, that, you know, this is innocent people's organs that we really have to stop it. But I am just so frustrated. We've been known this issue for last 30 years. And we really have to do something more than just the hearing here, but the whole world, we have to work together to stop these horrific things. But thank you very much for giving me a little more time. Thanks, Commissioner Steele. 
Well, I first want to begin by thanking the panel. I want to thank Chairman Smith for leading what is absolutely a difficult conversation to have, but it's also an important conversation to have with the American people, one that too often we see in this bipartisan, bicameral uh, committee examining really the autocracy that is happening within the Chinese Communist Party today. For years, the U.S. has heard rumors of the non-consensual transplant of human organs, otherwise known as organ harvesting, happening inside Communist China. I can think of no act more heinous than taking a political prisoner, strapping them to a medical bed, and stealing their body parts from the inside out, and then launching those on a black market, or worse, the type of genetic analysis that we're talking about today. As you can see behind me, though, this is not a sci-fi movie. This is not written from a horror book. This is happening right now, today, in the most populous country in the world. And those who have repeatedly been persecuted, the Uyghurs, Fang Gong, and detainees, are oftentimes the subject of these heinous crimes, but they are not alone. It is expansive and is routine throughout China. In 2006, independent reports alleged that tens of thousands of Hong Kong practitioners in the re-education through labor or rental detention facilities in China were victims of organ harvesting while they were still alive, but ultimately resulted in their deaths. Independent reports have also shown that nearly 25,000 Uyghurs are the victims of organ harvesting every single year. The time for the madness, the wholesale slaughter of a population has to stop particularly when it's used under the guise of doing science. So I applaud Chairman Smith for your leadership on this and for the difficult issues that you continue to bring forward with this commission, but most importantly for those who cannot defend themselves. So with our witnesses today, uh, I'd like to begin with uh, Ethan Gutman. You're a Chinese study fellow researcher. You've helped lead at the Victim of Communism Memorial Foundation. We'll begin with looking inward. Have Western corporations been complicit in the oppression of Uyghurs and Falun Group members here in the United States or been co-opted as agents of communist China in their endeavors? I, I, I'm going to, uh, I think Maya might have more to say on that question than me. So uh, I, I kind of hand it over to her. I just mentioned the Medtronic ECMO connection, which I think was significant right. uh, in Let's put it this way. Before ECMO, Medtronic ECMO got involved, uh, you could maybe do one or two organs from a human being and get away with it, uh, keep them fresh and get them to the right places. This is also something D.D. Kirsten Tatlow from the New York Times looked at very closely, the logistics of it. After ECMO, it became possible to harvest as many as four healthy organs from a single person. This suddenly turning a person from $100,000 into half a million or more for a foreign organ tourist. This is a dramatic difference. It became an incentive to harvest Falun Gong. It improved, it improved the chances that you'd make real money and, that, uh, and so forth. But, uh, I, I think after transplant technologies and medical, medical practice has been really progressed over the years, especially from 1990s and 2000s in organ transplantation. So the organ transplant only can develop if the organs do be accepted by the recipient. And this is not just a DNA sequencing, but it's a lot of, you know, the blood test and HLA, they call it, specific antigen on the surface of the, of the cells and the organs as well that has to match with the donor. And now I think the technology is HLA typing, so how the matching donor and the recipient are a match and they can. And then after organ transplant care, like you know, immunosuppressant drugs and all of those been developed really well and then transplanted organs can, uh, the first two years of up, up to 60% rejection rate before. And right now it's decreasing that rate because of the post-transplant care has been developed. The medical field has, you know, the scientists worked and, and so on. And I think the immunosuppressant drugs help. And the DNA sequencing just comes into that because the more of the genes can be sequenced, the less 
uh, differences between the donor and the recipient in the genome, the, the better the outcome that the, that organ will live not just 10 years, it can live in that organ, in, the, in that um, recipient for 20 to 30. So you really prolong the, uh, the organ, transplanted organ life in the recipient so by it's DNA clear sequencing. To say, Dr. Melitopov, that not only is China working to develop uh, an exploitation and long-term facilitation yes. of organs uh, for a profit, but the DNA sequencing on the front end to make sure that, that, that organ is capable Absolutely. to be transferred um, is a huge part of the business model, if you will, of how this is done. Yeah, you know, I'd like to talk with Matthew Robertson here. I know you're coming in uh, from Australia with us. Um, Mr. Robertson, you're working on uh, a number of studies, your most recent execution by organ procurement. We just talked about DNA here. Um, you documented in your, uh, through the Australian Strategic Policy Institute in 2020 that Chinese authorities have been building a DNA database largely of the male population. We have some folks here in the audience here in Washington who are still looking for family members associated with this. Is it fair to say not only is this the largest police-run DNA database in the world, but that there is a concerted effort to identify and track all men in the country in this type of uh, roundup? Thank you for your question. Um, it's the scale of that program, um, yes, is very extensive, and it was almost um, not known about until an enterprising investigator began looking at a large scale at Chinese media reports. It's unclear what the purpose of that was. It does appear to have been a campaign to gather DNA data on males across the country. Um, the connection with that and the organ trade is unclear. Uh, it's not clear that there is any connection. But I want to touch on a point that you made about uh, the complicity of Western um, corporations with this industry in China. And uh, I think it's fair to say that Western companies and institutions, you know, healthcare, um, you know, hospitals, medical centers have been instrumental in the rise of China's organ transplantation industry. I can just give you a couple of examples. So Roche, it's a Swiss company. I mean, it has a US financial presence. They built the first organ registry for the PLA uh, in the early 2000s. Um, some of the other drug companies have been sponsors of Chinese, the Chinese official transplant associations. And they've funded research by Chinese uh, surgeons during a time where there were no voluntary transplants. Um, and this is not even to mention extensive training, at least hundreds of Chinese surgeons who have engaged in organ trafficking have been trained in the United States. Um, so the Chinese transplant industry simply could not have capitalized on the, you know, the incarcerated population of political prisoners without gaining the know-how from the West. Um, this is something that, you know, ha has already happened and we need to, you know, study it, investigate it, understand actually the dimensions of that contact. Um, but there could still be ongoing, um, you know, ties, money being made um, and things that can be done now. So I think the first step is understanding what has happened and then um, stopping it to the extent that it continues. Mr. Robinson, if such an investigation were to be taken, particularly into how the West has intentionally or unintentionally emboldened the harvesting of organs from China, would you have recommendations for this commission that we could take um, for both the investigation piece and to be able to do that fact-finding mission as you've done on the DNA side? Yeah, so uh, one idea, just a uh a starter is an audit of what the NSF and the NIH have funded um, and whether money has gone as sub-grantee, probably not as, a, as the principal awardee, but as sub-awardee 
um, to any of the many hundreds, nearly 1,000 hospitals in China that have engaged in organ trafficking. Um, so these are some of the biggest hospitals in China, biggest healthcare centers. It would be almost surprising if um, NIH money has not gone to them. So that should be accounted for. Um, there's also going to be training at taxpayer funded medical centers across the United States. Uh, so the Cleveland Clinic is certainly one. Um, now, so some of these are going to be private and some of them are going to be public, but there may be a uh, record request that could be lodged with these institutions and uh, Congress could put some muscle behind getting them to look through their databases because they'll have this information in an archive somewhere about who has come from China and received what training. And so, you know, as part of an investigation that could be put together with our data sets of, uh, you know, transplant surgeons and entities in China from this data set of medical publications and our cache of surgeon biographies. So we can put together on the U.S. side, you know, when they came, what training they received, and then their activities in China, you know, what transplants they participated in prior to 2015, let's say. And then you could get a picture of what has the complicity of um, of U.S. institutions been. I mean, there's much more. There's you know, there's visa bans. I mean, the most kind of provocative suggestion I've made is actually using the SDN list. Um, so you know, the same kind of way that you know Iranian nuclear physicists are treated, where just there's no financial ties, no U.S ties at all, um, no, you know, export control in the work. So the blocked persons list, that would be kind of the most, um, the most stringent or extreme response that the US government could engage in. But if we're going to kind of buy the story that's being told here about the gravity of these abuses, that would seem perfectly warranted. Um, but I understand that would be a, a huge process. Uh, but certainly, I think it'd be worth worth considering. And in principle, there's nothing preventing the U.S. government from doing that if it so wish. You've laid out a compendium I think that we should all look at. I asked the rest of the panel, but I mean, things that are immediately concerning. One, that we have U.S. taxpayer dollars knowingly going to potentially thousands of hospitals inside China that would be harvesting these organs. I think it's secondly safe to say that it's not just China alone that is benefiting from this practice. We have seen time and time again that others, particularly those in the West, are benefiting from this harvesting of organs. And then three, to your point, that the facilities and the medical professionals who have been trained here in the West, under the aegis of the medical code and Hippocratic Oath, are then being used as instruments of either the state or with knowing negligence to then harvest their fellow countrymen is beyond the pale. Uh, I'd like to open it up to the panel. Are there other recommendations that you would have here, either on the DNA mapping program that China is undertaking, or two, in holding the actual institutions accountable within China who are doing this harvesting accountable, what we can do on this side of the Pacific? Can I make a very quick suggestion on this? One thing I wanted to mention uh, just very quickly was that uh, Matt I talked about uh, uh, Roche, and you know it's interesting that Roche was doing testing, of course, of its uh, immunosuppressive drugs in China, and it was using China is a very cheap place to do that kind of testing. Uh, you've got a big population of people who received an organ, uh, but those organs were coming from Falun Gong in some cases, undoubtedly, especially at that time when Roche was doing this in the early 90s. It is also true that Pfizer got involved in that as well. Uh, uh, Pfizer did testing in China. They seemed to truncate their testing program or at least try to do it as quickly as possible because it was a controversial idea at that time. This is 2007, something like that. Uh, but I think it's really worth looking at the immunosuppressive industry because this is, uh, people were killed to, to allow people to test in China. I think that's a really unethical idea. Uh, I'd mention one other thing, and I don't know how, where, how this falls into a category of how American policy could affect it, but okay, that's for you guys to figure out to some extent. But here's a real problem of the spillover 
from China, which is, and I get this from David Matus, he says, in Busan, Korea, at a symposium in November 2022, the first Asian Organ Donation International Symposium, this was in uh, Korea, China, and Japan, uh, and I've looked at the records from that, and a couple of the speakers talk about replicating the Euro transplant system, that is to say a cross-border allocation of organ donations. Uh, the speakers showed absolutely no awareness uh, that such a system would be the allocation to Japan and Korea of organs sourced from prisoners of conscience in China killed for their organs. Now, this is a classic case of, of, as I say, of normalization of deviance. It's exactly what China wants. Their system of reform that they have always touted has really been about that. It's about saying, it's not about reforming themselves, it's about putting these systems in so that other people are doing them too, so the Chinese will feel okay about it or whatever. Uh, so this is, a, uh, the, the, the evidence is going that way. And that is, it seems to me, is one of the most important boils to lance here. I'm not quite sure how to do it. But I know the ISHLT thing is, is very helpful on that, but obviously maybe, they, maybe just even some explicit language from the U.S. government on this would help a lot. Dr. Leverson, did you have a follow-up on that? Yes, sir, Commissioner. I Sorry. You know, we're in the natural resources uh, hearing room, as I understand it, and, and I think, you know, the simplest answer to your question, which is the approach we took in Texas, is you're not going to stop the supply. Um, and I think it's important to understand that, that in, in its clearest form, uh, a, a communist government, whether it's China or another government, looks at a human being not as an individual with inalienable rights, but as a natural resource. And so if that can be monetized for the benefit of the uh, collective good, um, you're never going to stop that unless you can choke off the demand. And so that's the approach that we took in Texas. And that's what I'm here today uh, urging you to do is aggressively stop the flow of dollars from uh, Americans to China and other countries paying for these procedures. If nobody wants the organs, then they'll stop taking them. I think that is probably one of the most salient recommendations that we can have is that holding folks accountable outside of China as well as identifying the threat coming from inside China. It's a two-tier approach that we need to take comprehensively. Uh, Mr. Chairman, what I'd like to do going forward as well is to come up with a list of recommendations that could be actioned by committees of jurisdiction um, to be able to address this, both holding China accountable on the international scene, particularly those doing business with those thousand plus medical institutions operating in China, but then equally holding ourselves and our allies accountable for the export market that has proven so lucrative for the destruction of human life inside China. With that, I yield back the remainder of my time and I thank the Commissioner Nunn, thank you. And as always, thank you for your very well-informed and incisive questioning, but also your recommendations. And we will work with you on all of that. Thank you so very, very much. I just, you know, one, um, Mr. Gutman, I, I, the first time I heard you talk about <clears throat> the ideal age for harvesting being 28 years of age. We know that when somebody gives their heart uh, in a voluntary fashion or one of their loved ones does it, it's a result of a car accident that has been catastrophic or, or something. Uh, it, it is not, you know, a, a government official saying, let's look at the 28-year-olds and cull those uh, out, of the, out of the herd uh, in order to destroy them to steal their organs. And so the, the despicable nature of what China is doing about 25 years ago, I read a book uh, about Unit 731 that Imperial Japan had operated inside of uh, uh, China, where uh, POWs, many, many Chinese, were, were, were vivisection was performed on them without uh, anesthesia, Dr. Allerson, as you, as you know. And, and uh, they also did some organ harvesting there, uh, not for transplant as far as we can tell, but for other reasons. And they tested all kinds of things like anthrax, dengue, or, or not dengue, but anthrax and other things uh, on them. Horrible, horrible, horrible stuff. And, and the Chinese rightfully are outraged by what had been done at Unit 731. Well, this is their 
Unit 731 in China today, taking these wonderful young men and women, and I think, uh, Ethan, you had said previously that it's pretty much equally divided between males and females. Uh, so we've got a lot of young women and a lot of young men in the prime of their years uh, being taken by a dictatorship to steal their organs. And um, one of the things, that, and maybe you might want to speak to this, that we've been hearing about more and more is that there are also dedicated wings or hospitals uh, where uh, Xi Jinping on down in the Chinese Communist Party, uh, if they need a liver, they need some other organ, uh, you know, a, a very young and vibrant and healthy 28-year-old uh, will be involuntarily providing that uh, to them. So it's their way towards longevity uh, at the hands of committing murder in order to get there. Uh, plus, there's also the financial incentive as well. Uh, that they make money on this, but um, if you did any of you wanted to respond to that, but I, I just think that you know when I read that book and when I first heard through Harry Wu about organ harvesting, first thing I thought of was Unit 731. Uh, having read that book as, as a newer member of Congress uh, way back when, um, the designated hospitals. Would any of you want to speak to that, um, um, or? You know, I thought you made a very, very, very good point, um, Ethan, about the, uh, about the hospital in Aksu. Uh, uh, that was very, very enlightening. And if you wanted to elaborate on that at all. And then your final comment about Congress can stop Beijing's ongoing attempts to normalize medical deviance uh, and the passage of the Stop Organ Harvesting Act could galvanize the international transplant community to stop seeing research and investigation into Chinese harvesting as inflammatory, but rather as a quest for justice on behalf of those young men and women whose only crime was that they were healthy. What a profound ending to your testimony. Thank you. I have nothing to add. Anybody else like to add before we... Uh, close the hearing. Thank you so much. You've given us so much to act upon, uh, so many insights, as you do on a regular basis, but now in open hearing. Deeply appreciate it. The hearing is adjourned.